So now the question is, how do you represent model uncertainty? So the idea here is, um, what we're going to do it is we're going to describe a decision ma maker who doesn't have a single model. What's the model? <laughs> Don't disappoint me. It's a probability distribution over a sequence. So what, what this decision maker is going to have is he's going to have a set of models. Okay, now my conscience comes in the room. Chris, uh, it would be Chris Sims. Um, and he would say, well, wait a minute, if you have a set of models, or, or Mr. Bayes, or Savage, they would say, oh, you have a set of models? No problem. Give me a probability distribution over the set of models. It's now a compound lottery, and I'll make it a single model. So if you can put a probability distribution over the set of models, you have a single model. But then I would say to Chris, um, and, and Chris would say, that's what Chris Sims would say. That's what any intelligent person could do. I'm, not, I'm going to disagree with him because if he says, um, "Give me a probability distribution over a set of models," I'll say, "I'll give you a set of probability distributions over a set of models," and then we'll just keep talking forever. So what uh, what my guy is going to do is he's going to refuse to he's going to refuse to um, give in to the Bayesian imperialism of reducing everything to a, um, a single model. When I say I don't trust my model, I mean it. I don't have a single model. I have a set of models. So that's how we're going to represent it, a set of models. And what Lars and I are actually, okay, good. So I don't want to scare you early. So I'm going to have a set of models. So now, if I have a set of models, how do I make um, a decision? So what, here's what I want. Okay, I use, in class I use something, it's, uh, this operator has not caught on. I'm the only one who ever uses it because it's, it's not mathematically well defined. It's called the want operator. Want, W-A-N-T. So here's what I want. I want a decision that's optimal for all, no matter what the statistical model governing the data is. And actually, the Bible says, seek and ye shall find. But actually, there's a footnote that don't seek too much. So this want operator, you can't do it. You, can't, you can have a model. You can have a decision that's optimal for one mo model. What's a model? Probability distribution thing. But it'll be op it won't be optimal for nearby models. So I give up on optimality. What I want is a decision that's good enough for the entire set of models. That's what I want. I want a decision that's robust. That's what my wife saw when she said, be cautious. I want a decision that's going to be good enough, even if I'm wrong about my model's wrong. If my, and so the, this want operator about how greedy you can be is going to come back into the picture. OK. OK. So how do we manage? Well, this is it. How do we manage decisions if we're going to make, um, if we're going to act as if we have a set of models? The idea is, okay, this is what my friend Lars Hansen has done for a big part of his career. He wants, and actually this is what non-parametric statistics, what, what do you call it, semi-parametric statistics does. I want to construct bounds on value functions. I want to get valuations um, that are correct for, that are going to give me estimates of values no matter what probability distribution within this set prevails. I want cautious evaluations. So you can think of expected utility. So think about expected utility. So an expected utility guy, and uh, you either teach that or study it, he has a single model, single probability distribution. What, is he, what do you do if he has a whole bunch of models in his head and he refuses to have a single model? So what my guy is going to do is con construct a bunch of expected utilities and try to make decisions that let them sur surpass bounds on expected utility that are going to prevail no matter what his model is. So if I have sets, I'm going to have, I, I'm, the only way I'm going to make progress is with bounds. That's the idea. <clears throat> so our tool const for constructing bounds is there's going to be a point at which you're going to think I'm paranoid when I do this, but it's not really paranoia. 
tool for constructing bounds on value functions, we're going to use min-max expected utility theory. This is actually classic. Wald used this. And Savage, actually, if you read Savage's book, which you should sometime, his whole book is about uh, turning your back on min-max expected utility, but half the book's about it. So our tool for constructing bounds is going to be min-max expected utility. There's going to be a two-player game. Okay, and it's going to be like this. There's, you're the maximizing player. You want to maximize expected utility. But there's a minimizing player called the evil alter ego or the evil, uh, evil agent. Lars calls it the evil agent. He's, he's been to too many movies. But the idea is the minimizing player, he looks at your decision and he tries to choose a probability distribution which is going to minimize your expected utility given your decision. You want to maximize it. The reason that evil agent is really your friend is, look, look, what, he, look what he's doing. I'm going to say, I'm going to use this decision rule, which would be great if my model were correct. And what the minimizing agent says, okay, you use that decision rule, I'm going to pick this, prob this probability distribution. Now it's not going to do so well. So now I'm going to go to a Nash equilibrium. So I'm going to say, if you're going to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to modify my rule. Evil agent says, oh, if you do that, I'm going to do this. And now, now we go, we keep iterating, and we, get, we go to a Nash equilibrium. At the Nash equilibrium, I'm playing a best response against that worst case model. And by doing that, I'm attaining this bound. That's the whole idea. I don't know if you've ever been in the army. I think that's what we did. Like when we're, like in, inf you know, in infantry school. Okay, so, you know, it's my job, I'm a, I'm a company commander. It's my job to defend this hill, you know, this little valley. I got 150 guys working for me. And then uh, I look at the hill and I say, oh, if the, guys, if the enemy is going to come through, it's going to come through right there. That's my expected, you, you know, it's going to come through there. And then my lieutenant says, um, oh, that, and I'm going to put all my guys there, and then um, we're going to be ready for them. And my, um, my, because uh, that's my model. And my uh, lieutenant says, well, yes, that'll work if there, but look over there behind us. Uh, I said, oh, it's really hard to get through there. They're not going to come through there. They're probably not going to come through there. And he um, says, well, well, does a worst case analysis. So in the Army, you're always doing that. You're always putting multiple models into it. Just by being cautious. Okay. So how do we measure it? Okay, I told you I was going to scare you. Relative entropy. Many of us became economists because um, we hated high school physics and we hated the second law of thermodynamics and um, entropy and we, w we never wanted to see it again and now today you're seeing it. Okay, so what rel relative entropy is, it's the unexpected log likelihood ratio. That's all it is. A likelihood ratio is the ratio of two models. I told you, a model is a probability density over a sequence. So a likelihood ratio is a ratio of two models. I'm going to take its log. It's got to be non-negative. And now I'm going to take the expected value of that using what distribution? I have two models. I, got, I have a choice. I can use one or another. I'm going to pick one of them. And that expected log likelihood ratio is a measure of, it's actually a measure of how difficult it is statistically to distinguish the two models. Econometricians see that all the time. That's used in likelihood ratio tests or in Bayesian model selection tests. So what this does technically, it bounds rates of statistical learning as sample sizes grow. And there's a whole beautiful theory, you should learn it sometime, called large deviations theory, which is all about this. It works like magic. Okay, so, entropy. If, if you are distressed by me using that term, you're not alone. So look at this quote, it's one of my favorite quotes. When Shannon invented his quantity, didn't know what to call it. Shannon is the person who invented information theory. He consulted von Neumann, who was hanging around the same place, John von Neumann, on what to call it. Von Neumann replied, call it entropy. It's already in use under that name, and besides, it will give you a great advantage in debates because nobody knows what entropy is anyway. <laughs> 
in my experience with macroeconomists, you know, it's like, I don't know. We're, we're kind of a lower species of economists, we are. But entropy site, you know, sites, it gives, it just gives terror in their eyes. Okay. So what we're going to use, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a model. Okay, so, so the, the conversation goes like this. Lars and I invent a model. We take it to Bernanke. This happens daily in the Fed. Have a model. People work really hard to estimate the model. They take the model to Bernanke. And uh, it's a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. It's one model. Bernanke says, do you trust it? Guarantee me it's correct. They say, well, what do you mean by a model? Bernanke says, you dope. It's a probability distribution over a sequence. <laughs> okay. So then, so then they, they say, no, it's, it's a good model. It's a good approximation. Discussion goes like this. I think it's a good approximation. Prescott always says this all the time. Good approximation. And then Bernanke says, to what? Now the guy says, uh, well, if I knew that, I would have written down that model and brought you that. So it's a good model, it's a good approximation to a model you can't describe. So Bernanke presses him more. What do you mean by good approximation? Well, I think the relative entropy is not too big. And, and this model might be statistically hard to distinguish from the real model that's generating the data. So now the, now the deal is, here's the vision. Abstract space. There's my model, a point. I'm going to put a ball around it. It's an entropy ball. I'm going to make the entropy, I'm going to make the entropy ball so that um, it's big enough so every model in there, now that's a huge set of models. It's uncountable. Um, all, all absolutely continuous probability distributions with respect to my model are in there. V very hard to distinguish. Um, and, 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 and the guy talking to Bernanke said, it could be one of those. That's the deal. And then what Bernanke's going to want to do is, and Bernanke's written about this, he's going to want to make decisions. Um, actually, if you think about QE3 and things, he's going to want to make decisions that are correct, not at just if this model, that, that are good, not only if this model rules the data, but if one of these. So that's how. So now the question is, who confronts it? So who confronts, model, fear, of mod, who confronts fear of model misspecification? So think hard about that. So I'm going to say everybody. So I'm going to say we the model builders do on a daily basis. But now here's the thing, because I'm a rational expectations person, so do the agents inside our models. Okay, so now I tell you, okay, I gave a talk, a bad talk about this kind of stuff. Bob Lucas was in the audience. He came up to me afterwards and he said, why do the agents in the model have to be like us? And what I said, you know, I said to him, you, you, Bob Lucas and I do not get to say that. Because if you go back to the beginning, because we're old, if you go back to the beginning of rational expectations, where did it start? It started with John Muth saying, criticizing models in which people had adaptive expectations, and there was a discrepancy between the predictions that the model builder was making and the agents inside the model. And, and what Muth literally says is, we should put the agents on the same footing as ourselves as statistical forecasters. And you know, that's what, that is, you know, so when Lucas and I were kids, nobody knew how to do that. We didn't know how to do that in, in comprehensive in models, like macro models. Lucas is famous because he's the first guy to figure that out. And it was hard. Because we didn't know what fixed point theorems were properly. We didn't really know. And, um, so Lucas doesn't get to say that. So like if, like if, I, if I say that we, we as model builders confront this problem, it's very likely that the agents inside our model do too. And I'm going to come back to that. So, so that's largely my line. We haven't convinced Lucas. So I'm going to say private agents confront it. 
I'm going to see government policymakers confront it. Okay, so this is going to cause, cause all hell to break loose. Um, okay, so in the following sense, if you're a macroeconomist or a finance economist, um, how are you going to, how are you going to, see the beautiful thing about rational expectations was um, the probability distribution that I talked about, rational expectations equilibrium is a probability distribution that's endogenous. You're determining it as a fixed point because people's beliefs influence outcomes. So you got to, that, that's why it was hard to do. So we figured out how to do that the recursive competitive equilibrium. You know, we took a map, so, so here's how we did it. Um, actually, this isn't how Lucas and Prescott did it because it was too, this didn't work out, but we figured out how to do it afterwards. You take, you take a mapping. Here's what people believe. Those beliefs generate actual outcomes. So you take a, a perceived probability distribution that people believe, a perceived model, that gives rise to an actual model that generates the data. They generally won't be even, equal. So there's a mapping from perceived models in people's heads to actual models that are actually covering the data. Well, take that mapping and iterate on it. That's what Lucas and Prescott started. What they found it was explosive. But there's other ways to find a fixed point. So what a rational expectations equilibrium is, it's a fixed point in a mapping from a, a, a probability distribution that's in people's heads, a stochastic process, a model that's in people's head, to the actual model that's governing the data. Go get a fixed point. Okay. So now what do I do if people have sets of models? So here's what Lars and I do. We're, we're ruthless. Okay, we want to stick as close as possible to rational expectations. So our deal is we're going to do that same kind of mapping. So it's every, all of us in this room fear model misspecification. We have different interests. We have different interests. But the deal is, we're going to, largely, we're going to we all share this common approximating model. And there's this entropy ball around it. So we all share the common model. And we all have this set of models. But we're going to do different things. We're going to make different decisions. So Lars and I are going to restrict where the equilibrium concept is going to mimic the rational expectations, but what's going to be determined is the center of this ball. That's arcane. So what it is, is if you do it this way, there's an extension of a Nash or subgame perfect equilibrium, a self-confirming equilibrium, or a recursive competitive equilibrium. So we know how to do this. This isn't, only, this isn't the only way to do it, but if you have multi-agent setups where, where people have sets of models, you're going to have to confront this. And this is only beginning to be a frontier in finance. Okay. So notice what happens. So if you and I share a common approximating model, but we have, we have different, we have this ball around it, and you do max min expected utility and, and I do it, then what happens is ex post, my minimizing probability distribution, and that's the, that's the probability distribution that rationalizes my decisions. Because when I'm doing a zero-sum two-player game, I'm playing a best response against my worst-case beliefs. That's my tool for getting a robust rule. You're doing the same, but you have different interests than I do. What's going to happen is you're going to have a different worst-case model. So now somebody's going to come, somebody's going to come, around, come along, and they're going to see is it looks like we have belief heterogeneity. This is a machine for generating endogenously belief heterogeneity, or what looks like belief heterogeneity. And there's some observational equivalences that come here. Ex post, a researcher could come in and um, build a model with heterogeneous beliefs that would reproduce the data that we get. Um, it would be a superficial model. Anyway, so that's what happens. So this turns out to be a, a disciplined model of belief heterogeneity. The reason I mention this is, um, especially since the financial crisis, but for other reasons too, there's a wave of, there's a wave of research. Gina Coplis has done it, Bloom and Easley, other people. Um, goes back to Harrison and Krebs in a beautiful paper. 